Okay, welcome back. Hey, today what we're going to talk about is properties of materials, and in particular, mechanical properties of materials. And um, yeah, I'm just looking for my uh, pen device to kind of come back. Maybe I don't need it in this slide. But uh, and, and we're going to use this as a basis for a number of things going going forward. And let's do that first. So where does this fit in the curriculum? First of all, um, this is a again the Columbus pacing guide, as it as I understand it. Ninth grade science, and, and really, there's a few things that this again brings together. I think you know nature of science, and really what this lecture has in it is a way that we can uh, really go at uh, the way engineering works. We we really try to deal with properties and then solve a whole bunch of different problems once we know those properties. Uh, motion and force, and in particular we're going to do a really good job on, on force and, and learn how to measure force, and we'll get into this with a spring later on, it's something we'll hit in further lectures. A little bit of energy, uh, forms of energy, not too much. Uh, we're going to start talking about classifications of matter, um, and we will also, um, uh, let's see, do that, and, and we'll also go back and Everything should come back in just a moment. Resume slideshow. Um, and we'll get back to atoms in the periodic table. We'll show that these forces we put on are actually acting on individual atoms, and that's, I think, pretty pretty interesting. Then again, they'll kind of come back to chemical bonds. So those are the things that we'll be really hitting. Um, and again, it's not really sequential, but I think you could still fit this into your course, and we'll come back to this at the end. So what are we going to do today? Um, we're going to explain the basic differences between metals, ceramics, and polymers. We're going to hit that in greater depth later on, but we're going to start that. The big thing we're going to start talking about is what we mean by materials properties. What is a property of the material? What are the units we use? How do we measure it? We'll be able to have your students measure that um, on, on their own, and that is uh, something that's in the, the ninth grade standards. And In particular, uh, two properties we're going to try to get after is strength, stiffness and also ductility. We're going to develop from scratch the idea of a stress drain curve and we're going to develop some experiments that we can do in class. I'd like to think they're kind of compelling experiments but uh, I think I'm the wrong one to judge all that. We'll uh, look forward to your comments on all of that. So anyway, structure and properties. Let's go back to something we all understand. Uh, the spoon. Spoons have been around almost as long as people and certainly as long as civilized people, and we've got three ways we can make them. We can either make metallic, you know, if you're ritzy, you do silver, um, more often stainless steel. If you go get uh, carry out, usually what you end up getting is a plastic spoon. And uh, if you go drink, uh, eat soup at a uh, Chinese restaurant, you usually get a ceramic spoon. And already you know that there's some pretty significant differences between the properties of a metal, plastic, and ceramic spoon. Uh, think to yourself what those might be. Um, give it a second. I, I usually do call and response in a class right now. but uh, So you take a metal spoon, put a big force on it. What are you going to do? You're going to take that thing and you're going to bend it. But it'll be pretty stiff until it bends and we'll get that kind of deformation. If we've got a plastic spoon, you put a force on it, it'll, it'll be actually much more compliant, much more floppy. You can bend it around, but it will generally snap back. If you take a ceramic spoon, it's not going to bend very far. If you really instrument it, you might find, yeah, you can bend it a little bit, but mostly if you, if you push it too hard, it's just going to crack, or if you drop it on the floor, it's just going to crack. There's a lot of nuance. This is all what material science is, is really trying to engineer those properties. But fundamentally, it all goes back to atomic bonding. The reason the metallic spoon does what it does is because of metallic bonding. It's easy to, to develop that kind of deformation in there. The plastic spoon, it's not nearly as stiff. Today we'll figure out how to measure that. Uh, in the ceramic spoon, it can't plastically deform. It can't change its shape, but a metal spoon can change its shape. We can bend it. And we're going to start getting into the, the fundamentals of that. First one I'll do is just three slides to show basically why these things are different and how they connect back to chemistry in the periodic table. So here is our periodic table. Um, then this one's a nice version. It shows we have metals, nonmetals, and intermediates. There's a whole lot of metals on the periodic table. Basically, 
if you kind of go through here all the way over back to here these are all basically metals and metals we can almost always make in a pure form uh, for example uh, let's just imagine and one we'll be dealing with in pure form is copper we'll also be dealing in this with pure form uh, with aluminum these two materials in particular like to pack in relatively simple cubic arrangements and ones that, that fill space and the ones that are most common we may or may not talk about them later in this course is a body center cubic which we call BCC face center cubic and this is an example of a face center cubic structure or hexagonal close packed this is BCC FCC HCP the way we often uh, abbreviate these things. I don't want to get into too much detail, but basically they, 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 the metals pack into these nice simple arrays and those nice simple arrays are a big part of what gives metal their properties. You can pass defects through those and allow, allow those arrays to change shape permanently or the metals to change uh, neighbors permanently is maybe a better way to say it. And that will allow the material to deform. So that's what metals look like simple like that one one element stuck together uh, in these crystals that can deform typically and that's what makes metals what they are and we'll get more to the properties later polymers um, the, the key idea of a polymer is basically you got covalent bonding along these long chains and this is polyethylene these are the ethylene mer units basically you break these double bonds form single bonds and you develop chains like this and chains can have up to or more than a million units that repeat like this and again this million we do 10 to the 6 or sometimes we write as 10 e6 and again uh, just to do, do logs we'll be dealing with big numbers again here uh, it, very often in this but we have millions of units like that and those all fit together in a covalent chain. The chains are held together with weaker van der Waals forces between them and that's what gives us the properties in polymers that we end up having. We're going to get back to that later. We're going to talk more about polymers in some depth. Ceramics and glasses are compounds again and um, common ceramics are things like silicon carbide and alumina for example. Um, silica which is also often the basis of glass and the, char the defining characteristic of a ceramic is that you've got a metal or non-metal ceramic element like B and then a metal or non-metallic elemental solid like Y or the, uh, like A I'm sorry A is your metal or non-metal ele elemental solid bonding with a non-metal or elemental or non-metallic solid element. So for example, uh, they're, they're, they're compounds is what we really want to say. They, they take this form. Again, they typically for ceramics have a crystalline structure that looks like that. But because the bonding is so strong in these cases and usually the crystals have such low symmetry, these can't really change neighbors. You can't change shapes within these crystals. And um, so that, that gives them a, a different set of properties. And we're going to talk more about metals and glasses, uh, metals, ceramics and glasses and polymers later. And the difference between a ceramic and a glass is that for a glass, you don't have a crystalline structure. And... Um, so we're going to get back to all these things. We're going to measure properties of these things. And, and the properties of those three different classes are different, and it is based on the chemistry that's in there. Okay. What I want to do, I think this is a great topic for ninth graders. What is strength? How do you know if something is strong or weak? And how do you make something strong? The way we figure that out is it's really sort of a resistance 
to breaking it in some way. We want mechanical strength. So how do we test for this? We break stuff. That's something that uh, I, I still enjoy and I think at the ninth grade level I think it's a, <laughs> kind of the ninth grader in me that enjoys this. So we get to break stuff. So, so there's a few ways we can look at this. We can look at um, resistance to crack growth. We can look at resistance to bending. We can look at resistance to permanent deformation. Permanent deformation. Say it one more time. Deformation. And uh, it's always a resistance to, to putting forces on something, okay? Always. And, and so that's really a great link also to the whole ninth grade thing because we can now say, okay, forces, they do stuff. To, 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 to matter and that's something we can measure and as I've mentioned before one of the most common ways we measure force is basically by uh, using a spring and uh, we're gonna be doing that very directly so so strength is really resistance to something breaking by force so we got to put some force on something and that's gonna be a big topic what we do today so this is actually not a new topic. Um, this was done back in the day, back in the Renaissance by da Vinci. And we're going to come up with a lab that very much looks like what da Vinci did back when. What he did was he had a, had a wire. He developed a force. And uh, force, is force is, is mass times the gravitational constant. So what he'd do is put some mass in there and then mg is the force that that would put and that would basically put a force on the wire and the wire could only take so much so much force and then it would eventually break and over the years this is basically the the, the very first one of the first maybe the first maybe the early on version of something we call the tensile test very commonly done thing in material science is a tensile test and uh, what we ultimately get out of a tensile test is something called stress strain curve and what we're going to do in this lecture and we will also have a, um, a, a separate uh, movie that we will do that uh, will demonstrate how we can actually do this so we're going to do what da Vinci did take take wires put a mass on the bottom and then we can just see when things break so I'm not what I'm going to do in this lecture is first go through this as you might use it in ninth grade science and then we're going to go back and I'm going to talk about it the way we might train engineers which is a lot more abstract and takes a lot more for granted so uh, hopefully you'll like um, this approach so, so what we're going to do is first of all measure breaking force and this is this is something I think can be pretty compelling when you can break stuff in the name of science and this is a big part of what I've been fortunate to do in my career is uh, break and blow stuff up in the name of science and um, it's a privilege to get paid to do that so, so um, here's what I uh, would say is so what we're going to do is take some of these wires or fibers of the same compo composition load them until failure is reached so we'll just use the da Vinci approach back here have a wire have a bucket beneath it add known amounts of mass see when things will break so what we can do is we can take nylon fishing line um, if you're a snobby fisherman or want to catch really big fish you might use something called Dyneema fishing line which is chemically very similar we'll talk about this when we talk about polymers but, but much stronger um, we can use metal wires and in here I've got um, several metal wires and if you go to McMaster and put into the search browser it says search and there's a little thing like that put in wire you will find all kinds of materials and wires and diameters McMaster car is a absolutely great place to get all of this geeky stuff that you might want to use in your science classroom um, here in central Ohio if you order it one day uh, the warehouse is in Cleveland 
it arrives the next day, no expedited shipping charges, and for you know, ten dollars you can get a, a spool of wire typically. Um, highly, highly recommend uh, that. Uh, it, it's like a hardware store, but, but much better stocked and actually I find much more convenient. So uh, these things you can get easily from um, McMaster. Fishing line, maybe. I, I got my fishing line from Amazon. Um, if people are interested, uh, uh, I'm sure we can get some glass fibers. We've got one of the great glass companies, uh, Owens Corning, is just out in Granville, Ohio. They make uh, they basically engineer anyway the, all the world's big part of the world's fiberglass. The, the leading center for that is right here in Granville. Um, sewing thread we can do elastomers, and, and, and so what I want to do now is I want to transfer and talk about exactly how you can do this in your classroom setting. So what you do is you go to Amazon, McMaster, the hardware store, or you just come to me. I've bought uh, spent uh, a couple hundred dollars on wire over the past couple weeks. And um, I've got literally miles of it. I'm more than happy to share it and put it on spools for you if you're going to use it in your classroom. And um, th this is what I have purchased. And uh, let me go through what we've got here. Now, first I'll say what we have and then talk about how we can use it. First of all, this is just a simple, what I'd call a fish scale. It can measure up to um, up to 45 pounds. Um, and we can do this by weight or by using a fish scale. Uh, this column here, I've got stainless steel. And I have two types of stainless steel that are all at ten thousandths of an inch thick, or in, in diameter. This is soft. This is hard. And uh, it's incredible or chemically identical, but by the way we uh, process the structure, we'll talk about later, we get very different properties. This stuff makes a lousy spring. This makes a great spring. Um, this doesn't stretch much. This stretches a lot, the, the soft stuff. So we can pick what we want. I also bought aluminum, several different gauges of aluminum, going from very fine to fairly uh, coarse nominally all the same diameter or the, the same material similar strengths different gauges I've done the same thing with uh, with copper this is pure copper fairly pure what we would use to conduct electricity um, by the way copper and aluminum are both wonderful conductors of electricity these materials also are very good once we get into Ohm's law if you want to make your own resistors uh, you can teach the students to make uh, basically lengths of wires with any resistance you like in it. You don't have to go buy your own resistors. And these are all um, metals up through here. And then I've got uh, polymers of various sorts here. Uh, this is maybe the most interesting. It's an elastomer, a.k.a. rubber band. And then I've got a fishing line. And here I got a three pack, which has four, six, and ten pound test. And uh, so if, if, you, if you fish at all, you know if you're going after small fish, you don't want a heavy line, so you've got more feel to it. Use light line, bigger fish, you go to a ten pound line. Uh, this is 20 pound test. These are all basically nylon. The big difference is the diameter of the wire. And, uh, and then this is something called Dyneema. And again, this is a very high tech recent polymer, extremely strong, extremely stiff stuff um, that starts rivaling the metals even though it's a polymer. So, um, okay, so, so, so if you can teach people to test metal here you can imagine easily breaking your group up your, your classroom into what do we have here one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen groups easily um, just on the stuff that I bought here and have all of them busily um, trying to understand the properties of their materials and then possibly coming back together and comparing and drawing some conclusions on how uh, materials vary from one another what I want to do next is go through 
talk about what those conclusions um, might end up being. Uh, forget this. So, so, so this is how we test. We'll get back. We'll get back to that issue in a bit. Um, so this is how we do the testing. Uh, these are what we saw call giant carabiners. Not sure if that's spelled right or not. Um, these are big enough that you can easily get your hands around this. What's nice about this is you can fasten your wire like that, and you could take a short length of wire, one fast on each side, pull with the carabiner, and you can understand by your own feeling, and this to me I think is an important part of science, you want to internalize it, you can feel the wire give, you can feel the strength, understand how it's breaking, and that's a way you can get it qualitatively. You want to be quantitative about that, and we do, we can do that this way too. I've got basically an aluminum wire that hangs from here to here, and there's a knot on each end, knot looks something like that. And um, it's an aluminum wire there, and I can go knot to knot, Here's my initial length. Um, it's on the order of about four feet. And uh, what I can do is I can take that wire and pull on it and, uh, and, and stretch that wire out and, or, or just break the wire and we can get to that later. Um, of the series that I bought, uh, everything should fail beneath about 50 pounds. I think the Dyneema probably being about the strongest of that. So this is all levels of mass and force and all that you can you can get within your classroom um, and I tell you still even though it's you know 40 50 pounds when these wires break it can actually be fairly dramatic fairly fun so um, what we can do is is basically just take these things and the very first thing is find out how much load it takes to break them two ways of doing that um, you can either load them up with the fish scale and use the fish scale on the carabiners to see uh, what you've got or you can be more accurate um, particularly uh, if, you, if your fish scale doesn't have a, a peak hold on it by using um, the da Vinci method of basically having a, a, a basket beneath this. So, um, so we measure the breaking force of all these wires again you got can come up with very easily uh, many different wires to keep many different groups in your class occupied and engaged and 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 you can probably come up with some games that uh, fit in there here if people have competing on this so what you're going to find immediately you, you can take for each of those those wires that I purchased you can find out um, what's the strongest what you're probably going to find out is, is the steel is about the strongest thread is about the weakest you're also going to find out that some materials stretch a long way before they break and the others don't stretch much at all. And hopefully the students can develop this through discussion. You'll also find that some of these materials stretch in a very permanent way. That you can stretch them to, to a large extent, remove the force, and the, the length stays in it. Whereas other materials, particularly the, the plastics, even the nylons, particularly the, the, the rubber bands, if you study that, it goes in a reversible spring-like way. So you, you, you stretch it a long way, and if you remove the low vump, it goes right back to, to where it came from. And it turns out the more material stretches, um, it turns out that uh, the material uh, ends up failing in a more dramatic manner as that happens. The other big one we're going to find that should be no... no uh, surprised to your bright students that the large diameter wires are stronger than the small diameter wires. So for example with the uh, copper, I've got copper wire there that goes from almost the diameter of a human hair uh, to something that uh, is, is, is pretty substantial. So, um, so we can start to study that and say, hmm, how should the wire diameter affect the strength? And we can get at that uh, very directly. So what we're going to do now is we're going to develop, hopefully you can you lead your students to this directly, material property of strength. Okay, And I think we can have them discover this absolutely for themselves. So here's the exercise that I would recommend. So get uh, three or more wires of the same diameter in both copper and aluminum I've got in, in varied diameters. And 
what you can do is, is if you have a, a classroom microscope, if you have something that goes to about 100x or so, and you can buy such a scope uh, from for about $200, and I've got one on the way that, again, we can uh, loan out, and this is from uh, the company that Andy Nightum uses, uh, and uh, Kennavision is... Uh, Or you can use a micrometer is another way of doing it. I think that the microscope is actually a little more transparent in doing that. So you can me measure it. You'll just see that you've got this wire. Boom. Measure the diameter. And then, of course, you could calculate the area. Area is equal pi r squared. And um, then you can measure the breaking load of the, of the wire, doing it Da Vinci style basically uh, keep loading it up until it breaks and, um, and you could do this with several different wire lengths as well and ask the question does does the length of the wire matter and actually it, it turns out for the, the in our case the, the length of the wire shouldn't matter too much it should uh, not not be a big deal back in da Vinci's day it did because flaws were very important in it uh, today the wire is pretty uniform all the way along so Breaking load is pretty much a breaking load, and length shouldn't matter very much. And uh, so you can say, okay, we know that, uh, say, a, 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 a three thousandths of an inch wire failed at, say, maybe two pounds. You could say, okay, we've got another wire that's going to be 0 0.06 inches in diameter. What force do you think it'll take to, 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 to cause that to fail? And, uh, or if you like, before that you could say, okay, imagine I've got uh, one of these, what force does it take to fail? If I have two of them, what force should it take for it to fail? Well, it should be about twice. You do about four, you can get them all loaded the same way. It should be about four times as great. And you could develop the idea that the cross-section of the wire that's in, under stress is what's really important. Okay, so you could have a contest, for example, and say, uh, what is the strength of this wire? Well, your bright student should be able to tell you, well, the area is four times as big, therefore the breaking force should be about four times as big. And uh, you might get one winner if you don't give them anything. After you reveal the secret sauce, maybe predict the failure load for the next one. And uh, it should scale pretty much with the area. So what you can do is, is, is lead this to the, the idea that there's this thing of, of strength, which is force per area. And you should find for all of the pure copper, the strength, which is force over area, should be pretty constant. Not perfect, pretty constant. And you can make predictions based on that. What you've done at that point is you've shown why we use these complicated units, not that complicated. And you've also shown the idea of a material property that you can measure. You've shown your students that they can devise a test to measure that and they can be predictive of other things. Okay. Then later on after that they can go on and say, okay, um, which is stronger, aluminum or steel? And you could predict out of this whole suite of things what's, what's what. So really moving towards engineering principles that you can use in design. So with this, uh, what I would do is if you can get your students that far, and I really look forward to comments on is this something that's doable or, or, or not, uh, I would say congratulate your students on developing one of these most engin important engineering concepts and structures, mechanics, mechanical engineering, and that's the idea of, of stress and strength. These both have units of force over area, and stress is basically the force that's applied divided by the area. And that's really a measure of what you're doing to the system. And then the strength is really the force at failure over, over the area. And we can come up with units on that. And the units are usually pounds per square inch, newtons per square meter. And uh, if you know it, a newton isn't very much. It's named after when Isaac Newton got hit by the apple. So the force of a newton, a force of an a medieval apple on the earth is about the force of a newton. Uh, not very much. You spread out one apple over a meter, it's not very much, so we often deal with megapascals, 
which is 10 to the 6 newtons per meter or a million apples per square meter. So stress is what we apply. Strength is a material property that we use in engineering. We can talk about strong and weak materials. And then again, both have these units of force over area. Okay. Hopefully, hopefully you're all uh, hanging with me here. So um, can we get more data from this? And, 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 and yes, we can. Uh, the, the other thing that we can start to do is we could do an experiment like this and then behind this, I'm just going to use a different color. Um, what I could do is, is, is hang off of this knot. And I'd rather do it off the knot than, than off of this because if, if this beam bends, we're in some trouble. I could hang off of this thing a tape measure. okay? And I could let the tape measure be in the basket. I could have some kind of a, a, a thing there. And I could watch this thing stretch. And what's going to happen is if I put more mass into this thing, what's going to happen is this wire is going to stretch. So what I could do is, this is a great graphing exercise. So I can plot force on this axis, and I can plot a change in length in, in this axis. And if I do this for something like an aluminum, aluminum wire, copper. Let's just say initially I'm just going to do this with aluminum wire. And this, just imagine for the sake of argument, it's going to have a five thousandths of an inch diameter. And what I can do then is I can plot the change in length with force. Um, and uh, this, this is, you know, usually it's, we put uh, the dependent variable on uh, uh, this axis, the independent on the other one, but usually you're going to do this backwards. I'm going to do this the other way for a reason. And and you, you could do it the other way. You could use either sets of axes that you, that, that you like, but I could say one pound, two pounds, three pounds, you know, up to, say, ten pounds up here on a linear scale. And you'll find there's some change in length associated with this. And all of a sudden, once I hit something, it's going to, start to go over like that. Okay, So um, this is what we would call a force displacement curve, because this is displacement. And uh, I can do that. I could then, for example, do this with uh, another material or another diameter, say aluminum, and uh, Let's imagine I would do a ten thousandths inch thick. What I would find is it will take me about twice as much force to get similar results. So you get something that would look like that. Well, that, that, that's interesting, and you should understand that because the stress is going to be half as much on this than it is on that. So what I could do. I could make change in length here. I could do this on stre stress up here. And then what I should end up finding is that my two sets of data fall on exactly the same curve. And this is almost the essence of engineering, is having these master plots that have units associated with them that we can solve a whole bunch of problems with. So um, that, that that's what we could start doing. So you can get more data. Again, force and displacement would be the next next thing to do. Typically what we end up doing uh, is, is, is driving this change in length rather than applying a force. That's why we put the axes that way. Uh, but um, I'm going to put them this way because this is the way that we're going to often use this. So the next thing we can do is can we predict how much a wire will stretch at a given load? So um, First, focus on what we can measure. We can measure a change in length, delta L, and um, at a given uh, delta L, how does that change with wire length? Well, if I start with a wire that turns out to be twice as long, you're going to get twice as much change in length at a given stress. So it turns out that 
we can find, and you could set up experiments like this, a change in length is proportional to the wire length. I should say at a given stress. And so we can develop a new term, strain, which is just delta L over L. And uh, it's just a fraction, or can be expressed as a number. So you can just like the strain, if you have a 10-inch long wire, it goes to 11 inches length. Delta L would be 1 inch, and 1 inch divided by 10 would be a 10% strain, or strain of 0.1 would be the same thing. So, um, so for a given wire, we can find that a, a, the same load um, should always give the same strain so long as the diameter is the same, or I should really say a given, a given stress should always give the same strain. And I think it's I think it's neat and useful. Uh, hopefully you you will agree with me. So here's how you can actually do this. Um, th this is um, an aluminum wire um, that's uh, twenty five thousandths of an inch in diameter, fairly fine diameter, soft aluminum wire. Um, what I did is I hung this on and I just stretched. I actually used the fish scale. Turns out it takes about um, seven pounds of force. And I stretched this out, and you can see here's knot to knot, my initial length, and then knot to knot. It's changed in length, increased in length by, oh, maybe about 5% or so. But that is a permanent strain of that. So what we can do is we can figure out the stress, which would basically be the 7 pounds divided by pi r squared. This is my diameter, so that's 2 pi. And I can also come up with strain, which would be basically just delta L over L naught. Delta L is about oh, 3 inches, and L naught was maybe on the order of 50 inches. Okay. So that is that. So Next question I would like to ask is, is all strain the same? Let's consider that kit of materials that we ended up developing. Um, I can take the wire, put mass into it, and then see that this thing elongates. And let's consider uh, a, f a few different materials. Let's say, uh, let's compare aluminum and nylon. Well, it turns out, if I take aluminum this will probably stretch on the order of 10% strain permanently before it fails. The nylon is going to going to stretch, but if you remove the load, it'll stretch right back. Let me say it differently. Let's, let's consider something a little bit different. Let's consider copper and a rubber band. Again, if I take the copper, put my load on it, put some stress on it, let go, it's going to permanently change its length. There might be a little... Uh, elastic strain in there but what but it'll it'll keep a set keep a permanent set that's plastic strain and whereas a rubber band is gonna snap back so the way you'd introduce this to your students and maybe this is the way I should introduce this to you is uh, what you'd basically do is apply a load to put on say five percent strain remove the load see what happens and then compare for example copper and the rubber band What you find is the following, that there are elastic and plastic strains. So elastic is like a rubber band. That's why we call it sometimes an elastic band, meaning it's reversible. You remove the weight, and the fiber snaps back. This is important because this stores energy, and we're going to come back to that. That's why these materials make really good springs. You want things with a lot of elastic deformation to make a spring. Um, Plastic is the other type. It, this is where it doesn't return to its original position. Remember we started with a spoon. This is like bending a metal spoon. This is irreversible. It doesn't store energy. Instead, this dissipates energy. So elastic deformation is what you want for springs. Plastic deformation is what you want if you want to do something like metal forming and make a useful shape out of something. So now, 
if you're pretty advanced, and, I hope, and I'd be interested to see if you think you can get your students to this point, what we should be able to find is we take a given class of materials, for example, pure copper, I should be able to do a number of experiments where the material is the same, has the same materials properties, and I should be able to change this, this, this L naught, and then also the diameter. And regardless what we have, I should be able to get something I'll call the stress strain curve. When we have stress, it's basically force over area, has those units associated with it. And on this axis, I've got strain, which is delta L over L naught. And I should be able to do one set of experiments, say, for example, um, I've got uh, 0 0.003 inch diameter and I've got uh, 10 inches long. Do one set of experiments and I can get out something called the stress drain curve. If I, if, I, if I get really good measurement in here, you can see an area that's going to be really steep and then it's going to bend over like this. I could do another set of experiments where say it's 0 0.003 three inches diameter and say uh, 50 inches long and let's do that with that dot, do this with this. What this is going to do is actually if you make a really long one that's going to be much easier to measure the small strains so I can probably be more accurate here but this should all fall right about along the st same stress strain curve. Um, I could do another experiment where I use a different wire instead of just a different length um, and uh, all I want to do is change color and let's say I'm using a point point uh, oh, I don't think I, uh, point ten thousandths of an inch wire point zero one zero oh inches diameter and then say length of fifty inches Imagine I'll show that with uh, this kind of a marker. And I, I should end up getting something that, that's very similar. Might have a little bit different strength in the end because it comes from a different spool and all that. And then you get something that's, that's fundamental. This is something we call stress strain curve. So this is something that should be about the same for all materials that have the same nominal processing associated with them. So it's actually uh, quite, quite useful in the end to have that because we can make loads and loads of engineering predictions with that based on that. So based on a stress strain curve, we developed the idea of mechanical properties. And mechanical properties we care about are one is elastic modulus, and that's the stiffness in this elastic region. If I go back, you find that there's a slope along this region and elastic modulus is basically just delta stress over delta strain in the reversible region. And by reversible, what I what I mean is if I come up here, oh, I'm not there yet. I come up here and I unload, I'll actually go back down that, that elastic line, and we may talk about that more later. Um, yield strength is basically the um, stress at onset of permanent deformation. Ultimate tensile strength is basically just the breaking force divided by the initial cross-sectional area. That's our ultimate tensile strength. And then the other mechanical property we can have is strain to failure. You can now measure all of these things with wires of reasonable size in your classroom. So again, strain to failure would basically just be you take a wire. How far can you stretch it permanently? This would be 
delta L before it, it ends up breaking. And, and this, these are the kind of properties we as engineer, materials engineers try to manipulate by manipulating the material structure. So it turns out um, there's, a, a, there's various diff big differences between materials classes. Again, this is our logarithmic scale for Young's modulus. In, in gigapascal units, this is 10 to the 9 pascals, or 10 to the 9 newton per square meter. And this is 0 0.001, 0 0.01, 0 0.1, 0.1, 10, We see metals are up here fairly stiff, ceramics similarly stiff, polymers are much less stiff. You will see that when you do elastomers or even nylon. You can see this very clearly in the experiments. And then composites are, are generally up here, uh, much stiffer than the polymers. We can do the same thing for ultimate tensile strength. Metals and ceramics are pretty good. Polymers are generally not so good. There are some advanced polymers, things like these dynemas, that are starting to get actually quite good. We can measure that. And, uh, and then composites out here at the end. And uh, elongation to failure. Metals are usually in this area, in the area of 0.1% to maybe, actually, like, what, well, talking percents. Plastic elongation to failure. How much can you stretch something in tension before it breaks? Usually on the order of zero. 50% for metals. The ceramics don't do this at all. Polymers, really zero, so maybe 500 percent or more, depending on uh, some very remarkable things you can do with polymers sometimes. Composites, it's typically small, to kind of put that into context. So um, that, that's that. That's that, and that. Uh, and I see. Um, I wasn't quite sure how long the lecture was going to be. I see I'm 47 minutes in. I'm I'm not going to go um, into the rest of the lecture in depth right now. Um, I'll show you what what I did last time I did this lecture. On top of this is a more traditional approach, and I'm just going to leave these slides here for now and uh, talk about them fairly briefly. Um, you know, failure modes we can have. Um, there's some nice links, uh, particularly uh, this Cambridge group has some really good stuff on mechanical testing, the way it's typically done. Uh, the way it's typically done isn't necessarily the way I think you should do it in a, in a ninth grade handbook or in a ninth grade class. Um, PNNL handbook has some great stuff. I think Andy is going to be doing a demo for you. The ASM teacher's handbook has some, some good stuff. Um, we're going to finally get into manufacturing and stuff. Shape is also important. So that's reference material you can get. This is a, a lab that we may end up doing. Again, it gets into the idea of elastic deformation, which is based on bond stretching. Elastic is reversible. Plastic deformation, this is permanent deformation. The atoms change neighbors. It gives you a plastic deformation in that case. We can do this with those wires. Um, geometry and performance, we talked about the way um, Stress is really the right way to normalize things. It's the right way of normalizing against these size effects. And that's why we make stress. And we do normal stress or shear stress. And stress, this force over the area here, we talk, talk about shear stress often as being tau. Let me just write that so it's legible force over area. And then tau is force shear over area like, like that. Strain we talked about and talked about the difference between reversible and irreversible deformation um, and uh, it's linear elastic properties. This, this is a big deal materials property. The, the elastic modulus sometimes called the Young's modulus And these properties do come from interatomic bonding very, very directly. 
so we can make very good physics-based uh, estimates on what that is. This I've showed you, Young's moduli are very different from one material to the other. They can also be measured in bending, as we may end up doing soon in this class. Permanent deformation happens by atoms changing neighbors. And if you have a good stress drain machine, you know, uh, and again, we can do this with these, these fibers in your class. If you do stress versus strain, you can do load, unload, and this ends up having the slope of Young's modulus in it. Again, E is delta stress over delta strain. Usually we use an epsilon for strain, kind of a Freudian thing there going on. Again, yield strength we can measure, hardening is important, and these are things we may talk about later on. Okay, ductility, um, again, we talked about for metals. Um, this is an important thing, particularly if you're if you're um, bend if you're if you're trying to make things by plastic deformation. The other thing, if you do have a, a microscope in your classroom that can do up to about 100x, looking at the fracture surfaces that you get after failure could actually be very interesting for your students. I also believe, and you'll see big differences if you look at the suite of materials that I talked about. Toughness you can do things with, and this is I think is basically my last slide. Again, showing that I think this fits. We can talk about force. We can talk about um, later on energy storage in a spring. Um, this brings together how we classify matter and how atomic bonding starts to set properties. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Um, the questions that you will see online will be, um, we're not going to use the multiple choice tool, uh, basically put up answers and uh, everything, uh, everything will be good. And um, look forward to seeing you guys fairly soon at uh, COSI. Take care, and uh, we'll, we'll be seeing you online.